All right, time now for We Said, They Said, and tonight the power of the presidency, Donald Trump celebrating a major victory this week, a story making headlines in the U.S. and around the world. Well, the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld Donald Trump's travel ban involving people from seven countries. That travel ban, of course, targeting five Muslim-majority nations, North Korea and Venezuela. The Trump administration tried and failed twice before to restrict entry to the U.S., citing national security concerns. But as South African broadcaster SABC TV explains, this time, though, is different. The court found that the challengers of the ban, among them the state of Hawaii and others, had failed to show that the ban violates either U.S. immigration law or the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment prohibition on the government favoring one religion over another. Also different this time, the global response to the travel ban. Trump's first attempt to stop people from coming into the U.S. caused an international uproar. This week, though, the response seems much more muted. Still, news outlets that did cover the story were quick to criticize Trump. I wouldn't say it was my expectation, but I'm not surprised. Now, you know, at the risk of uh, alienating some of my American friends, you know, how this narcissistic self uh, righteous man got into the White House, it boggles my mind. All right, while some may argue this latest version of the travel ban is not a Muslim ban, others say it sends a blunt message of rejection. Activists and legal experts say Trump's intent remains the same to sharply cut off the flow of Muslim visitors and immigrants into the United States. All right, though, Germany's Deutsche Welle agreeing with that sentiment, saying Trump made good on a campaign promise. Being strong on immigration, showing that he is keeping people out of the United States, has been a key element of his foreign policy. At one point during his campaign, he called for a total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. All right, so Iran, one of the countries on the list, has been shaken up by the ban with an estimated one million Iranian Americans residing in the U.S. It has a lot to lose. Press TV running this headline, U.S. ruling on travel ban, declaration of war. And the country with presumably the least to lose, Venezuela, the restrictions there apply only to a narrow category of government officials. Still, the story did make the pages of Venezuela's El Universal paper. For more on all of this and the travel ban fallout, I'm joined by Nayara Haq, former White House senior director. She also was a senior advisor for the State Department. And with me here on set, Dean Abadullah, columnist with The Daily Beast and host of The Dean Abadullah Show on Sirius XM. Great to have both of you with us. Nayara, let me begin with you. Um, as we mentioned, a more muted global reaction this time to the travel ban, maybe because there's so many other things unfolding in, around the world, but has the world now just accepted this as a reality? Well, we certainly saw that this was the intent of the Trump administration. So the world, uh, if we want to talk about it as a whole, um, was not surprised about this decision, though I, th I do think people were hoping that the Supreme Court would be the, the, the shield for the Constitution and not the sword that Donald Trump has turned out to be uh, when it comes to human rights and basic rights of freedom of religion and freedom of the press. So, but this, it, it, Donald Trump has been building up to this for quite some time. And unfortunately, uh, you don't need the rest of the world to point out to us us, that this type of discriminatory decision making is also part of United States history. I mean, this this has precedent in Korematsu, in Plessy versus Ferguson, in the Dred Scott decision. Uh, so this goes back to the Supreme Court having made mistakes. And I do think that this Supreme Court decision about the Muslim ban, the travel ban, whichever way you want to call it, right. is going to go down in the hall of shame. So I know that, Dean, you wrote an article for the Daily Beast saying that this will embolden President Trump when it comes to his Muslim ban. What are you concerned about here? with this Supreme Court decision and what this means for the president in next steps that he may want to take? Well, well my real concern, frankly, are, are young Muslim Americans living in this country having conversations with their parents. And they're, explain, they're asking questions to their parents, like, why does the president of the United States want to ban Muslims? And they're already going through staggering bullying in this country right now, Muslim Americans. So my heart goes for them more than anyone else. We've seen a spike in hate crimes that I think is completely attached to Donald Trump's anti-Muslim rhetoric that began in the campaign on December 7, 2015, with a total complete shutdown. And I think, honestly, but all of this is red meat for his base. Okay, so what do you say, then, so, uh, let, let me just say this real quick. What do you say sure. to people who push back, say this is not a Muslim ban? You have countries like Venezuela that are on the list. You have countries yes. like North Korea. No, no, legally. I mean, no, I know no, you have no, a legal I understand what you're saying. Yeah, that, yeah. That is, uh, as a lawyer, yeah, I can tell you, you, see that you, this is a massacre. This is just camouflaging bigotry. Sadly, the Supreme Court of the United States has now turned bigotry into policy. And now you're right. They've done it in Karamatsu. That was the Japanese internment camp. Right. Red Scott. African-Americans not even being people under law. 
to me, the biggest thing is that Donald Trump, this is all about red meat. And I think people have to look at this, not just Donald Trump saying December 7, 2015, total complete shutdown on Muslims. Go back a step. The, the GOP has been marinating anti-Muslim bigotry for years. They were ready for Donald Trump to do that. And so do you think this is the beginning that, or the, I the end? Th I think any time Donald Trump needs to give red meat to his base, he will do that. We've seen him do it with undocumented immigrants, with trying to ban transgender Americans from serving in the military. He will pivot back to Muslims. He will maybe expand the ban. He will taunt Muslims. Don't forget, as president last November, he retweeted videos from a horrible anti-Muslim yeah. group in the UK. Let me uh, widen the conversation a little bit, Nair, because there's some news coming out of two of the countries on that list, North Korea and Iran, and I want to pivot to North Korea for a moment because NBC News is citing uh, intelligence reports that North Korea is stepping up production mm -hmm. of fuel for nuclear weapons. Are you at all surprised by these reports and the president's failure to kind of misread Kim Jong-un and his intentions when he said to him, I will stop? Right. And he's, uh, Kim Jong-un has said it multiple times before, at least on eight occasions, that he will work towards denuclearization. So that was nothing new when he made that commitment to Donald Trump. He's always walked away from the negotiating table when it comes to actually uh, committing to a verifiable and complete process uh, that is transparent as well. That that seems to be the sticking point. And th this, there was no deal at the summit. So technically, Kim Jong-un is honoring the spirit of the conversation and the letter of the conversation. It could put Donald Trump in a very very difficult position when his own um, federal agencies, his own intelligence operators are telling him that not only is Kim Jong-un ramping up his uh, nuclear activity, um, but he's actively trying to hide it from the United States. And there have been discussions about whether or not to reveal to the United States um, the number of nuclear warheads they have and potentially to limit the United States to inspecting only one of the two sites. So this is um, the National Security Advisor John Bolton, um, the managing to duck right. this question, but it's going to be the question of the week when it comes to North Korea, is how does Donald Trump's, Trump square the circle of North Korea flagrantly ramping up its nuclear program when Donald Trump told America that it was taken care of? Okay, let me, uh, I want to uh, also talk to you guys about Iran for a moment because uh, you had uh, Donald Trump's personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, he was addressing a rally uh, that was staged uh, for an extreme Iranian opposition group in Paris. He spoke about regime change and referencing the recent stories uh, and protests in Iran uh, as a, a result of the currency collapse after Trump upended the nuclear deal. Take a listen to this. We are now, I believe, very realistic in being able to see an end of the regime in Iran. We can see it. We've lived through this before in other oppressed countries. When the people take to the streets and they protest day after day, like they've done in over 142 cities in Iran. All right, so, and then this is the same conference uh, right. that last year NSA advisor John Bolton uh, had a similar message. He told members of the opposition group that they would actually be ruling Iran before uh, 2019. Uh, is this an administration that has now openly declared, even though Rudy Giuliani is not a part of this administration, he's the personal lawyer, I should sure. admit, I don't know what he's doing talking about an Iran conference, but is this administration now openly calling for a regime change and pursuing that policy of regime change? First of all, can we keep Rudy Giuliani in France? Is there a way to keep him in the United States? States of America, I think most of us would prolong that. Look, you have John Bolton who wants a regime change. You, but we've heard this talk of regime change for years and years and years, and it's not happened. I, you know, it's a talking point of people on the right. And you talk to, when I talk to Iranian Americans here in this country, I have friends, a cross section of friends, they talk about the suffering of the Iranian people yeah. due to sanctions. It's a human cost, a human consequence of our sanctions that seem unfocused, uh, undirected. Regime change is a talking point, no different than banning all Muslims. It's a talking point. It's, it's a red meat for a base. Yeah, and it seems that Nayar, to give you a chance to weigh in on this as well, is this an administration now that, as in 2003, is pursuing regime change uh, in Iran? Is this a dangerous road that we're beginning to slowly slip down? Yeah, this is an administration that has sent ambassadors and surrogates like Rudy Giuliani around the world to frankly undermine um, our relationships. I mean, this is, it is, uh, Rudy Giuliani is all in on regime change in Iran. Um, Donald Trump is all in on supporting the monarchy in Saudi Arabia. So that alone creates tension in the Middle East because we're no longer a balancing power. We are now trying, we have, we have actively yeah. picked sides in the Sunni Shia conflict. Um, they, we, have a, we have an ambassador in Germany, who uh, Rick Grinnell, who is 
is actually making friends with the fascists there and talking about how he wants to undermine uh, the Angela democratically Merkel. elected government there. Yeah, absolutely incredible to see that. Rudy Giuliani, I have to remind myself, is the personal lawyer. He goes to Israel, talks about Stormy Daniels, goes to Paris and talks about regime change in Iran. Incredible. All right, Nahira Haq, Dino Badala, thank you both very much for joining us uh, this afternoon. As we speak, Mexico